Um, so first off, thanks everybody for joining us here today. We are excited for another alumni panel. Um, I will let Megan and Brennan do introductions after we kind of do this uh, formal introduction. So just so you are aware, this will be recorded and transcribed, like I said, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel afterwards so that anybody who's not able to attend today is able to watch that back and, and learn a little bit um, from, from what we're chatting about here today. So my name is Caitlin Gordner, and I am the Alumni Engagement Officer in the Faculty of Health. So I have the wonderful pleasure of connecting with alumni, um, you know, friends who I made while I was on campus or other people who have really awesome things going on in their lives to bring them back to some really fun events and, and things like that and keep them involved. So thanks to the two of you and soon to be three of you, Caitlin will be joining us um, for taking some time today. So before we get started, I just want you to territory acknowledgement. Um, so the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land granted to six nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Our active works towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, community building, and is in coordination with the Office of Indigenous Relations. So actually in the Faculty of Health, we are really, really fortunate to have Elder Maegan Henry, um, and he is our knowledge keeper on campus, um, and he is a absolute wealth of knowledge. So I have been learning so much from him, um, whether it's bumping into him in the office or eating lunch with him, or um, you know just understanding really the changes and stuff that they are doing on campus. And I encourage you to learn as well when you are able to. So before we jump into things, let's just do some introductions to the two of you um, so that they can get to know a little bit about, you know, your what and then they probably read your bio already online, but just kind of your program um, at Waterloo, your progression and where you are now. And if you want to share anything fun or exciting, I'll let you do that too. So Megan, I'll pass it over to you first. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Caitlin, and just want to respectfully acknowledge um, that I'm joining from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, uh, to territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, what is colonially known as uh, North Vancouver, and uh, my name is Megan. I'm really grateful to be here today. Thank you, Caitlin, for having me. I did my undergrad in health studies at Waterloo, which uh, is now known as, is it public health now, Caitlin? There's public health and there's health sciences. Yeah. So it's health changed. sciences. Yeah. Okay. So it was formerly uh, health studies, yep. uh, a BSc, and I did uh, a co op designation while I was there as well. After I finished my undergrad, I took a year off and I came out to Vancouver and I worked at UBC uh, as a re research assistant. I worked in the Faculty of Kinesiology, focusing on uh, mental health and physical activity research. Uh, after that, I returned back to Ontario, uh, lived downtown Toronto for two years, doing my master's of public health and epidemiology at the University of Toronto, uh, specialized in uh, public health policy as well. And during that time, I had the opportunity to work a lot in academia. Um, following uh, my master's and uh, an additional couple years working in research at U of T, I moved out to Vancouver, where I currently work as an evaluation lead uh, with Child Health BC. I'll pause there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Over to you. Hi, I'm Brendan, and I'm glad to be here today. I did my undergrad in kinesiology at the University of Waterloo. In my second year, I started working as an exercise professional at the university, as well as different facilities. Uh, in the Waterloo region. I continued to do that after I graduated for a year full-time at Mulvady Athletic, and then started to be inspired to follow research and went to the University of Guelph to do a master's in biomechanics and neurophysiology. I returned to the University of Waterloo to pursue a PhD, which I'm currently completing and should be completed this year. During that time, I continued to work as an exercise professional but more recently, as I developed skills um, in research, I started to be recruited to help research and development teams. And the last five years, I've worked in research and development specifically for a company developing biotechnologies 
to coach and train individuals on how to apply forces in the workplace. That's great. Thanks for sharing. I just sent Kaylin an email as well, just saying no rush. I'm sure she's just stuck somewhere. So um, she'll pop in when she's able. And when she does, I will get her to do a quick little introduction as well. So let's start off with some of the more general questions. And then I do actually have some specific questions from um, students for all of you, for both of you too. So um, the first question that came through was, when you were a student, did you participate in extracurriculars? And if so, how did you manage your time effectively? Brendan, do you want to start off with that one? Sure. I did participate in extracurriculars. I was a varsity swimmer for the first three years of my undergrad program. And as mentioned, in my second year, I started also working as a personal trainer in our gyms. I also volunteered as a strength and conditioning coach. It is hard to manage your time. And I wouldn't say I'm the most proficient at time management, but uh, prioritizing what you do when you do it can be important. And there's definitely other things that you'd sacrifice along the way, which meant maybe I wasn't as social as uh, I could have been sometimes, or maybe at times I wasn't as well prepared for an assignment or a test, or the other way around, maybe not well prepared for um, working with a team or with a client so realizing that along the way and keeping track of it i developed strategies to be more proficient so by the end of my undergrad i had that under control i was able to participate in extracurriculars while also doing well academically yeah that's great thanks for sharing megan what about you yeah thanks uh, for that question it's a it's a really great question because i think when you transition to your undergrad, it's the first time, you know, you're away from family, you're away from your friends, um, you're moving from a very comfortable and familiar space, which is high school, um, to, to a huge campus. Um, and you really want to strike a balance between, uh, you know, doing well academically, but also making time for social activities. And so I certainly participate in extracurriculars. Um, you know, volleyball, badminton, gym, um, playing squash. Um, and in addition to that, I also worked too throughout my whole undergrad. Um, and so I think one of the ways I helped manage uh, both my social life and school is to try to do some planning. And I do, I make a lot of checklists on what I'd like to achieve each day. I found that helped uh, kind of keep me on track. But it really depends on the person. And I think, you know, the strategies to make you successful at balancing that academic space and that uh, social space and your extracurriculars might look different depending on the person. I know for me, I uh, am very motivated by time pressures. And so what worked well for me would be to sometimes leave things a little later when it came to like a, a specifically like written assignments than most people would be comfortable with. Um, and I did some of my best work when I was under some more like time pressures. And so I think it really just depends on the individual. Um, some people like to spend more time prepping and maybe like to structure their days into chunks of work versus school versus social. Um, but yeah, for me, I think like checklists um, were, were really essential in, in kind of keeping me on track for deadlines. I'm like that too, Megan. I don't want to fall for procrastination, but uh, you know, sometimes be it under a crunch. Yes, we need the we need the pressure to perform. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. And everyone works differently. Yeah. Um, so question here about co-op. Um, if you were in co-op, did you find it helpful? And what types of jobs did you do? One, two, you want to kick that one off? I think were you both in co-op? You weren't running, were you, Megan? Yeah, I was okay. in co-op. Okay, do you want to start with that one? Sure, yeah, and I will preface this. I, I didn't mention this in my introduction, but I actually started my undergrad in recreation and leisure studies. I did my first term there um, and pivoted to health studies after that. And I found both the coursework and co-op to be particularly helpful in uh, navigating where I wanted to be with my career and uh, what degree I wanted to pursue. 
this is a throwback, um, but my first co-op was at the registrar's office at the University of Waterloo, and that was when I was in rec and leisure. I was doing a lot of just admin work, really nothing too related to rec, but I learned a lot of valuable skills um, in terms of how to work in an office environment, workflows, communication, uh, really fundamental pieces about like workplace culture and um, yeah, how to conduct conduct yourself being a young professional. Um, after that, I went to eHealth Ontario. So this is me moving into my health studies degree. Uh, my second co-op was at eHealth and that was for an eight month placement and really enjoyed that. I was doing a little bit of like project coordination work. Um, I worked on supporting an electronic health uh, record development. And that was kind of my first entry into the health space um, and really enjoyed that placement. It was government, so that was a nice exposure to working in a government setting. And then my last placement was at uh, the Center for Addictions and Mental Health. Um, and I found with that placement, I started to get closer to the type of work I knew I, I liked to do. Um, we worked a lot uh, with, with special populations, focused on health equity um, and, and access to services. And so I found co-op really helpful um, in learning you know, some really fundamental skills about how to carry yourself and how to sh kind of um, how you want to show up to work. And I learned a lot about what specific areas I'd like to to move into. And I felt like my trajectory in undergrad was really um, just a big learning experience in terms of what uh, field and what specific um, career you want to move into. And it wasn't linear for me at all. Like I said, I was in rec and leisure, um, navigated to health studies, and I felt like I grew a lot with uh, the opportunity to network through my co-op placements and just learn a lot about myself and what area I want to move into post undergrad. That's great. And I think co-op does a good job of that, of like where you can try different jobs. I think the other point that you really hit, Megan, is that Although like your first job might not have been like your dream job or something where you're like, oh, this is exactly what I want to be doing. You can still get skills out. of it. And I think that's so important to know is that even if it's not, you know, the be all end all position, still figure out what those skills are and really what you're learning from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and so then not being in co-op, do you feel like you were able to gain those work experience skills in other ways through part time jobs or through summer jobs? How did you navigate that? Yeah, I think I was able to with the part-time jobs I had. I was fortunate to uh, build a network to have part-time jobs in personal training and strength and conditioning in different settings, which was really great. I do agree with Megan and I echo her comments that getting experience in potential um, settings that represent the career you want to follow can be a huge asset to understand what your future could look like or whether or not it's for you. And I think it's something that many people struggle with in terms of deciding what they want to do when they grow up. And usually my advice is on, on the same lines, get experience, whether it be paid experience or volunteer experience, getting it might not necessarily be through co-op. I've heard that the co-op pro program has advanced a lot since I was an undergrad and provides many great opportunities. It's actually great to hear some of the opportunities that I've heard recently that students are involved in. Whether it's that or whether you pursue it on your own, I would say pursue it. If you have something that's on your mind that you'd like to do when you're done your undergrad, get into now, get some experience, talk to people that are in it. It can provide a lot of insight. Yeah, no, I like that. And there's so many opportunities out there, right? So like, don't be afraid, I think, to, um, to really get out there. Great. Okay, so I'm going to continue to go through the list of questions here, but if anybody has any questions you want to ask or something has sparked while we're going through, feel free to put your hand up, turn your camera on, or just write in the chat. More than happy to ask any questions throughout the time here today, but I will continue working through our list. Um, Megan, I have two for you here. So the first fold of the question is, how did you feel your master's helped with your career path? Yeah, that's a really great question. 
Um, so I did my master's of public health in epidemiology. It's an MPH degree, not an MSc. So I didn't do a thesis, um, but I did publish five plus papers from my MPH. And that's a whole other topic. Uh, people talking about, you know, whether they want to pursue an MSc or an MPH. Um, so I digress, but I think it was really instrumental for me um, in just developing some really kind of like hard skills. So I took epidemiology specifically because I wanted to develop um, those more advanced skills in statistical analysis, um, in manuscript writing, in machine learning. I've dabbled in that a little bit through my uh, master's. And I wanted to be able to come out of my MPH with some skills that um, that would position me really well uh, and be a really kind of competitive graduate um, for an epidemiologist position. And when I graduated from my master's of public health, I st actually stayed at U of T in a research lab that I did my practicum placements in and looping back to practicum placements. I really highly recommend if you do get a chance to do those through your master's program, uh, they're a great opportunity because it just kind of continues that trajectory to give you the chance to understand and find out what types of work environments you like. So do you want to work in government? Do you want to work in the in private sector? Do you want to work um, for a community based organization um, and so on and so forth? So it, it gives you much more exposure and much more responsibility when you're in your master's. The expectations of you are much higher than when you were in your undergrad. And so I think just kind of looping back, my master's gave me a good understanding of what it would be like to work as an epidemiologist in a government setting, in an academic setting, because I had that experience through co-op. But what I will say is I've actually pivoted. So although I am trained as an epidemiologist and I've worked um, a lot in academia in the past seven years, I now work uh, in government for Child Health BC. We are under the Provincial Health Service Authority, which means that we have a provincial mandate. And so uh, you could think of, say, like Public Health Ontario is the synonymous organization in Ontario. I work within that organization specifically uh, to improve care and access to care for children and youth across BC. And I work now as an evaluation lead. So I've pivoted from being an epidemiologist now into evaluation because I got to experience in my first couple of years post masters um, what evaluation, what an evaluation specialist or an evaluation lead uh, does in their work and how. It's a really nice extension for me from epidemiology. Um, I'm happy to elaborate on that more, but maybe I'll pause uh, there just to, to open it back up. Yeah. So this is kind of a two-parter and you actually kind of hit half of it anyways, but if there's anything you want to add was what would you say are some of the soft and hard skills needed to be successful in quality improvement and evaluation? <laughs> I love that there are some folks in the audience that are thinking about evaluation. Um, I'll just finish my kind of last thought there, which is that I loved working as an epidemiologist and I loved working in research. Um, one of the challenges I experienced was that we published a lot of papers and a lot of the times the learnings and the insights went off into the academic sphere. and the uptake of those learnings and insights that we spent years working on were never uh, leveraged, never used to implement change. And so that's something I really struggled with in uh, research. And that inspired in part my move to evaluation, which is, to summarize my job, it's basically somebody comes to you and they say, we have a program, we have a service, and we wanna know what we can do better. Uh, what we can improve upon, what are our strengths. So I've leveraged a lot of my research uh, skills and knowledge in mixed methods um, and in really robust uh, approach to, to understanding kind of strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
And that information that I gather through that process is directly implemented. And you can see the benefits of your work um, being being used. And so that's the beauty for me of evaluation work. And I would say for the first time in my career, I am now probably got seven, eight years post undergrad. I feel like the alignment with my goals um, and what the kind of impact that I want to have on a day to day basis and my lifestyle too for my kind of work life balance are perfectly aligned. Um, and so that's been really important. It's been something I've been looking for. Um, I don't know if I touched on the soft and hard skills uh, question, but but I think the hard skills certainly that set you apart in epidemiology are having those advanced analytical skills, those mixed methods, so experience with quantitative, qualitative data, different uh, statistical uh, softwares, so R, SAS, SPSS, Python. Um, and and I think some of the softer skills are how you how you approach the work and the kind of lens that you bring to each project. I think acknowledging you know the groups you're working with, we do a lot of equity based work in my position, so I'm constantly reflecting on my life experience and how that impacts how I show up to the work. Caitlin, it's really great to hear that we now have an Indigenous elder um, at, at the school because I know that wasn't something that we had. And I think working in BC, there is uh, a large Indigenous population um, and there is a lot of history and context to um, health outcomes for these groups and other groups. And so I think some of the softer skills are, you know, just being aware of your personal biases, how you show up to the work, um yeah are some things that that I reflect on on a daily basis too and still use yeah I think that's great um and yeah thanks for sharing that because I think that like you said it's a big question and there's there's so much to it so I think you know that having the students be able to understand that is really helpful so Brendan over to you for the hot seeks um so a few questions for you so for students interested in pursuing a career in biomechanics or health technology what advice would you give them based on your own career path and experience? That, that's a great question. Usually, especially when we think about um, technology development or industrial work, and we look back on the curriculum that we follow in a kinesiology program, a typical one, or even the one at Waterloo, uh, we don't have that bridge. So in that case, possibly pursuing a master's program can prepare you. Uh, Megan touched on some great points there for why someone would. And I think part of that being it puts you in an environment where you have to become a problem solver an independent learner and a lifelong learner. We're able to take those skills and continue to use them whether or not you use them in your or learn them in your master's. Um, if you have a clear goal, it can be easier to refine that trajectory. If your goals are more general, it might then be good to get that work experience or that volunteer experience to help you refine them. So if your goal is to work in industry, to work in research and development, you probably do want to establish yourself with those skills and pursuing a master's program, I would say would be the bare minimum. Master's programs then can be different from place to place, but also as Megan touched on, it gives you the opportunity and flexibility to develop the skills you want to. There will always be opportunities to gain soft skills, hard skills, and having that trajectory, having that objective of wanting to work in industrial research and development can really help you tailor your program so you get the most out of it. Yeah, that's great. And I think everyone is going to be so different in it too, right? So it's important to have that perspective. So kind of going off of that, um, looking back on your career journey so far, this is a big question. What pivotal moments or experiences have shaped your approach to lead you to research and development? Wow. 
<laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, about 33 minutes. <laughs> so when I started my undergrad, uh, I was actually injured and it was a severe injury. I couldn't swim uh, for a year, so I couldn't participate in university swimming. I couldn't even sit in class. I was in pain. So some of those experiences, working through that injury, witnessing how different practitioners, I'd seen physios, chiros, athletic therapists, how they all work, really gave me some insights into the field as a whole in terms of rehabilitation and why it's so important to give people the most effective care we can. Working as an exercise professional also helped me realize how much we need to know about the human body and how much there's left to learn. Being inspired by the professors I had in my undergrad, it really pushed me to see research as a solution to that problem. The more we could learn about the human body meant the more effective our strategies to preserve or improve musculoskeletal health or physical performance could be. That's really what pushed me to be a researcher. When it came to specifically industrial research and development, which I think is what the question also included, that was something I did not foresee. When I got into pursuing a master's and a PhD, I never thought that I'd be working in industry or applying my skills to industrial research and development. And because of my experience, especially as an exercise professional and knowing how to coach human movement, that's really what got a few engineers who graduated from the University of Waterloo to approach me and recruit me into their um, startup. So something that I didn't expect, but definitely something that presented an opportunity that changed my path. And I took the opportunity to uh, see what I could do and learn from it. And it's definitely been an enriching experience where I've continued to learn throughout the process. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, like you said, how long do I have? We could take, we could take just do one on that question, I think. Oh, that's great. Awesome. All right, Kaylin, your turn to be on the hot spot. Um, let's do let's do a quick intro first. So if you want to give a quick intro of you know your program, kind of um what led you to where you are, what you're currently doing, anything fun you want to share about yourself, and then we'll We'll jump into some questions for you. For sure. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, sorry for being a little tardy and getting on the call a little late. Um, some things popped up and <laughs> took uh, my like... attention away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I am also Caitlin. Um, I am also a rec alumni from Waterloo. Um, I did therapeutic recreation and gerontology. Um, I then went on to do a master's in occupational therapy. Um, I graduated in 2021, so I've been working for almost three full years now as an occupational therapist. Um, I work at Kids Ability, which is a child treatment center, which services Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, um, Guelph, Wellington area. So um, the area that I was here as a student, I've stuck around and continued on. Um, so my my undergrad, I said gerontology, which is the study of older adults and working with the aging population. Um, I was very determined all through grad school that I was going to be working in a hospital. I was going to be doing rehab. I worked in a long term care home. That was what I really enjoyed doing. And that's what I was really convinced I was going to end up doing. Um, I had a placement during grad school that was virtual because I was a um, kind of like a COVID baby. I was a COVID grad baby. So my grad <laughs> school was mostly online. Um, so I did an online placement with Queens, which is associated, um, a program associated with Queens that was um, supporting uh, children and youth in the Kingston area in with developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, uh, intellectual um, disabilities, and kind of helping with an extracurricular program there. And that's when I realized that I actually did have a huge passion for pediatrics and working with children. Um, so when everything was said and done, I was interested in being back in the pediatric area and uh, kids' ability was just the, the place where I wanted to be because I wanted to come back to this area. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. 
lots of interest about OT, that's for sure. So I was saying mm -hmm. we did have some questions submitted ahead of time, um, as well as some that will come in as we're chatting. Um, so I'll do my best to condense them so you're not answering a ton. Uh, but I just actually had a question come in from Hannah here. So she said, I'm in rec therapy and I've applied to OT schools. I was wondering how you found the master's program workload. Yeah, so it, it's similar to your undergrad. Um, I would say coming from a rec therapy background, it was a bit different. Um, in a lot of ways, it was almost a full-time job of learning Monday to Friday. Classes were usually 8, 8.30, 9 start, and we usually went until about 3.30 or 4. Um, having breaks in between, so breaks to eat, go to the gym. Um, if you needed to go and have an appointment, you were able to kind of go and do that. Um, but it was big chunks of learning Monday to Friday. Um, you don't really have the opportunity to kind of do any part-time work. If you're looking to make money, you kind of have to focus on your work and getting your stuff done. Um, thankfully, at Queen's at least, I can't comment on other schools, we did a lot of stuff in groups. So if um, you had kind of a couple upcoming projects, what a lot of groups would do would be kind of splitting it up. So instead of everyone doing um, a little bit on every project, some uh, students would focus more on, I'm just going to do this project with someone else in my group. And that was kind of a focus. So you kind of have the options there, depending on um, your group dynamic and kind of who's in your little learning group. Um, but it, I would say it is different than what you're probably used to as a rec student. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like any master's is going to be a little bit different, right? So absolutely. I don't know where you're yeah. coming from. So another question kind of about that. So I'll throw one more at you, then I'll give you a break and go back to Megan. again. Um, what do you feel set you apart when you were applying into OT? Was there anything that you did in your underground undergrad that you found valuable? I would say things that were required for the program as well as kind of the extracurriculars that I did. So in therapeutic recreation, you have to do the internship and the practicum. I really sold the skills and the experience that I got through those two. Um, the one was in a long-term care home and one was at uh, Freeport Hospital in rehab. So I really sold how um, I know how to do this because of my placement. I am aware of this because of my placement. Um, and occupational therapy does in some ways stem from recreational therapy, that there is some crossover there. So even kind of selling yourself and kind of the skills, the classes that you took through your undergrad degree and how they are relevant to OT, how you could apply them to OT um, is kind of my recommendation there. Um, and then just some things on my own that I did. Um, I was volunteering with Special Olympics Ontario when they had the summer games in Guelph. Um, I did some kind of sports volunteering with intramurals. Um, I worked at the visitor center as an ambassador. So kind of those social skills and people engagement and communication as well. Um, those were things I went out on my own and acquired though. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And we were talking about a little bit about that what previously about co-op jobs and jobs that you're in, right? Like you're always going to find something valuable out of position. So really find what that thing is and kind of run with that. So thanks for sharing that. All right, Megan, back over to you. You've had a little bit of a break. Can you share some examples of projects that you work on um, at the Child Health, at Child Health BC? Um, and anything that you've done that's impacted children's services and youth? That's such a great question. Um, thanks for that. Yeah. So I would say one of our main um, mandates, uh, and Caitlin, shout out, uh, working in the pediatric population as well here in BC, uh, we focus a lot on critically ill children uh, through our work. So one of the projects that I've been involved with uh, is evaluating uh, the Pediatric Critical Care Project, which is a series of um, smaller initiatives under this 
critical care project, uh, one of which involves uh, sending experts in pediatric care from BC children. So these are physicians and nurses that are a very specialized training in caring for very critically ill children. We send them out to rural communities um, up north, so, so like Prince George, for example, or very rural and remote places on the island. And they go out there and they do workshops, simulations. We do lectures uh, with local providers on how to care for a critically ill child. And that's really important that those communities have the opportunity to uh, develop those skills from an equity perspective. Um, you know, pretty consistently we see uh, in rural communities poor access to care, uh, less access to very specialized care. So there is um, quite a divide in the quality of care that you receive. and. That project's very important to me because it brings that um, capacity building to the local setting. It helps keep children in their communities when the providers around them have the skills and knowledge to either uh, manage them acutely until we can transport them uh, if needed to BC Children's. But sometimes uh, the skills that they're able to develop through some of our programs is enough to keep that child comfortable and safe um, and cared for close to home. And I think that's also very important for families too, um, having their kid close to home. And, and yeah, so that's one project that I've been involved in. And as an evaluation lead, I approach that, um, you know, those workshops that we deliver, the simulations, the logistics of this, of sending providers. I do some work to understand what we're doing well. What do the community providers think of the of the workshops that we're delivering, what can we do better? And I summarize and collect all of that information through like surveys, through interviews, through focus groups, and I write up reports to to help um, kind of distribute that information and and bring it back to implement uh, into our work. Yeah, that's awesome. Sounds like some very meaningful work, which is really great. All right, Brendan. So your educational background spans across kinesiology, biomechanics, and neurophysiology. How do these disciplines intersect at your work? That's a great question. Simply put, if we think about human movement, it's not any one discipline or any one system. It's multiple subsystems working together to create movement and function. In my work specifically with Grip Tech as an um, innovation development researcher, understanding that interconnection, understanding that different subsystems work together to create function is a huge asset. Being able to then apply that to making meaningful decisions when it comes to developing technologies or refining them, or even interpreting data is exactly what I need to do in my job. Sounds like it's definitely a benefit, which is a great thing, right? To be able to have kind of those different backgrounds and different angles to bring in, I think is is really great. All right, Kaylin, back over to you. Um, so Hannah's actually also applied to Queens. Uh, do you have any tips on the application and the interview process? Yeah, so in terms of the interview process, when I was in grad school, I didn't have to interview for Queens, so I'm not sure if that's a new thing that they've implemented. Um, as well, when I applied, I was um, a successful candidate at Queens in Toronto. I wasn't successful at McMaster, and McMaster does do that interview process as well for um, OT. So I don't know if I have the best kind of advice because um, I sold myself on a piece of paper and they liked that enough to uh, to go ahead with me. Um, in terms of the application, I don't know um, if there is any last upcoming things. Um, I, I feel like maybe the, I, I honestly can't remember, it's been a couple of years since I applied. I feel like a lot of the stuff was in the fall, so I'm not sure if they've maybe updated some processes that kind of go into the spring when they're working on that decision making. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have much to comment on there. Sorry. No, that's fine. But I think like what you said before is like you were involved 
you know, you put yourself out there, you kind of figured out, you navigated your way through the process to figure out where you wanted to go, what you wanted to do. And it's really finding what those skills are that are going to make you successful. So it's like a resume, right? It's like, absolutely, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, I'll throw one more at you here. Um, how do you feel your background in therapeutic recreation has influenced your approach to occupational therapy? I would say um, the background in TR was very helpful. Um, when I was in grad school, there was, you know, a handful of kin students. There's a handful of kind of like biomed students. Um, there was a couple of rec kids as well. Um, but truthfully, people come from all different backgrounds and they're successful applicants um, into the program. Um, in terms of TR specific, I think the anatomy side of things was very helpful. The movement, um, understanding that made um, applying it in the program very helpful and beneficial. Um, there were a couple of courses where we did actually talk about recreation and leisure and what different occupations are and kind of how they fall into those. Um, essentially, occupational therapists were working on an individual's self-care, productivity, and leisure. So it's kind of the three circles and how they come together. And we're focusing on the function and how we are achieving these different tasks, these different occupations. Um, so coming from a background of rec and leisure, you know, that's already one of the three circles that we're helping with. So um, I felt very well prepared in that section of grad school. Um, and then, yeah, just in addition to kind of the more specific TR courses of um, the anatomy and the um, if you ventured out and maybe took a couple more science courses like kind of the neuroscience and the psychology as well can also be quite helpful. Yeah, so being that well-rounded person, right? Setting yourself up for success. All right, Megan, got one more specific one for you then some general ones. What challenges have you faced implementing evaluation strategies in the health system and how do you overcome these? Um, that's, that's a really good question. So it's implementing evaluation strategies in the health system. Uh huh. Or just maybe implementing evaluation strategies in your job. Yeah. Okay. That's a really great question. One of the things that certainly comes to mind is one really powerful way to answer questions we have about how well we're doing with the program or service is to look at health system outcomes. And health system outcomes to me are things like changes in uh, the health and well being of children or changes in um, uh, key indicators, like, say, um, readmissions to the emergency department or inpatient stays. And one of the main challenges we have in our work here, and I've also experienced it in Ontario, is around using population-based data. So that's linked health administrative data um, to answer some of these questions. There are major gaps here in BC in terms of following a patient's trajectory from their home community, their home hospital, um, to across the health system. So using um, like their, any care that they've received in a mental health setting is very hard to link and there's different reporting requirements across the province. So there's a lot of gaps in uh, admin data here. And so that's been one of the challenges I find in, in answering some of those more health system evaluation based questions is just working with the nuances and challenges of data integration in BC. And it's also, um, I would say, a challenge that is faced in Ontario, too. Yeah, I think you're going to see similar challenges, unfortunately. I think, unfortunately, across many of the different like provinces and territories, right? And realistically, across the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, absolutely. All right, Keelan, another question for you. Um, are there any opportunities at Kids Ability for shadowing OTs? Yeah, there is. Um, I, I'm i newer in my current role, um, so I, I'm mindful of how much I say, but we do have kids, or not kids, we have 
people come in that are shadowing. We have people that come in and volunteer. Um, I will say when I was applying for grad school and was trying to get some experience and understanding of what an occupational therapist does, um, I was almost always shut down by the people that I reached out to. So I kind of made it um, uh, more, I, I try to make it a focus that now that I have been successful and I've gone through the program that if people did have questions or they wanted to do a shadow day, like always willing to figure something out. Um, times of the year can be a bit busy, um, but yeah, if it was something you're interested in, um, you can always reach out. I'm on LinkedIn and we can kind of figure out the process there. Um, I am also I come from a different program, so I was in the school based therapy and now I've switched to early years, which is zero to three year olds. So if um, so, you know, Hannah, if you really thought you were interested in school based services, like I can always connect you with the um, manager in that role as well. And you maybe organize a shadow. Um, there's usually forms we have to fill out, but we have people here that are doing shadows and volunteering. So it's it's doable. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. That's what today's all about. All right, I have a general question for the three of you. So Brandon, we'll start off with you. Um, was there something that you feel that Waterloo set you apart from other students, whether it's in your master's or in your career? Biased, obviously, <laughs> but the program at Waterloo I felt was definitely better than I think what I've heard of other programs. I think having the breadth in biomechanics, neuroscience, physiology, nutrition, all helped to create a good fundamental base where I was able to understand those different subsystems we talked about, about the human body, to understand how it functioned. I think that was a huge um, factor in helping me be successful in applying that knowledge as well. And then I didn't do my master's at Waterloo, I did my master's at Guelph, but uh, having come back to the university, I've completed many of the master's courses here. And same to be said, our graduate program in biomechanics is actually world renowned and one of the best. So I think that's what really put me ahead or was influential in my development. That's awesome to hear. Megan, what about you? Do you feel like Waterloo sets you apart in any way? Um, yeah, sorry, I missed part of the question because I was reading the question in the chat. So it's it's how Waterloo kind of set us apart. Yeah, do you feel there was anything at Waterloo that set you apart either in like getting into your master's or in your current career? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, the co-op definitely like helped set me apart. I came into my master's with work experience um, that I could draw on. I had as a result of um, my co-op and working in undergrad, I had a like a paper that was under review. So I had some work as a result of my co-op experience and my uh, work experience outside of co-op that I was able to to use that to demonstrate my skills and abilities and how those would make me a really promising candidate for my master's. I do also think, you know, this is very unique to my circumstance, but there are not many undergrad programs that offer epidemiology as a course. And so I got to take uh, Mark, Dr. Mark Aramis. I'm not sure if he's still a prophet, uh, the faculty, but he taught epidemiology. And so I got to uh, take that course and apply to my master's and very clearly communicate that I knew well what epidemiology was. I've already started to develop those skills. And I think a combination of, of that work experience and those really um, specialized courses like epidemiology, I was able to leverage that to, to demonstrate uh, to the admissions committee that I was a really strong candidate. Awesome. Caitlin, over to you. Do you think there's anything that Waterloo did to set you apart? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I didn't do co-op. Um, well, I did a co-op term and then I realized it wasn't a good fit for me and that I was going to get that hands-on experience through my internship and my practicum. So 
um, have some paid experience, have some unpaid experience. Um, also, I took a year off between um, going on to grad school. So because I was in therapeutic rec and the internship, I graduated in the summer. I didn't think it was a really good fit for me to start school right away. Like I kind of needed to work and like make some money, deal with some of the undergrad student debt. Um, but I know like Caitlin, as you know, I worked with you in recruitment for the fall um, and that was really helpful because it was just kind of a nice break from the past four years of academics. I was able to um, work, make some money, do some more kind of like personal development, I would say, and then I was able to apply. Um, I had kind of all my grades because I had graduated already, so they wouldn't have been waiting on like any like midterm or final grades. Um, so I think just the fact that everyone's time and um, route at Waterloo is always so different, but always gets us to where we want to be, even if it doesn't look the same as like Megan and Brendan, um, that I still went on to grad school and I'm still where I want to be and I'm happy where I want to be. So just kind of accepting that, um, yeah, if you finish on a summer term, you can still take a year or two to, to apply for grad school, to go for occupational therapy. There are people in our program that were in their 30s and in their 40s and had made a, a midlife career change that um, they kind of had their own pathways that they got there as well. Yeah, that's a great tip, right? There really is not a huge rush. So in the grand scheme of things, you want to make sure that you're ready for what your next step is. All right, so we'll go to that question in the chat there for you, Megan. And then that's all the, actually all the questions that I have as well. So if there are any last minute questions before I wrap things up after this one, please feel free to write them in the chat there and uh, we'll get to them if we can. Um, but Megan, how was your transition? And then were there courses, certifications, certificate roles that helped you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will pop a link in the chat and I will talk to that. Um, so I, graduating with an MPH in epidemiology, had only heard about evaluation and quality improvement in passing through my master's. Um, didn't know a lot about it. Didn't have much of an interest in knowing too much about it at that time. And when I graduated, I was working um, in the population health analytics lab, uh, which is led by Dr. Laura Rosella at U of T. And I, we were approached uh, by some hospitals in Toronto about doing some evaluation work for them. And we had another epi who had done some evaluation work uh, for these hospitals in Toronto in the past. Uh, I was never involved in that because I had just joined the lab. And so the project was quite large and I had an opportunity to support our other, um, she was also an epidemiologist, but she has a bit of a hybrid role in doing evaluation work and needed support. So I had the opportunity to dabble in evaluation and uh, that uh, after about a year, that uh, colleague went on mat leave. So I took over evaluation work completely um, and I really just learned the skills by doing. I do think it would be beneficial to take some courses um, as well to supplement that uh, experiential learning. And one thing that I'm pursuing now, uh, and my work is actually supporting me in pursuing that, is a credentialed evaluator. It's a designation um, through the Canadian Evaluation Society uh, that basically has a set of standards that you have to meet uh, in amount of work experience, in courses, um, and, and a little bit of like an assessment in terms of skills to demonstrate that you meet the requirements for the designation. And, um, and yeah, so that's uh, one of the main certifications that I know of uh, across Canada. But to this point, uh, with the exception of a few conferences and workshops that I've done on, you know, embedding health equity and evaluation work, all of my knowledge that I've gained has been leveraging a lot of my epidemiology skills, like mixed methods um, and analytical skills, working with di diverse partners, um, my knowledge of the health system and the data available, um, and and using that information uh, to kind of support me in my role. And so nothing too formal uh, for training, but 
yeah, I'll pause there. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks so much for sharing. I think that this has been extremely helpful um, and uh, some really, really great questions that came through. So as you can tell, people are, you know, starting to think and interested and, you know, really wondering what that next step is going to be for them. So kudos to all the students as well who attended um, for really taking this time to think about your future and see what um, might be the best fit for you. Um, of course, thanks to the three of you as well for taking some time out of your day here to spend it with us. Um, I think it's just so great for students to be able to learn about different career paths and have an understanding of, you know, so maybe something they didn't know about or learn about a new career path or an opportunity that uh, might be different to uh, to what they have done or what they have thought about in school. So I thank you all for your time today and uh, wish you the best as you continue on in, in your careers. And if there is anything else, feel free to send me an email and I can try and get you in touch as well um, as, as more questions come through. So. It's sunny where I am. Hopefully it's sunny where you are too. Get outside and enjoy some weather and uh, we will chat again soon. All right, take care everyone.